pleasure to host uh, such a power pack uh, set of panelists uh, this is navin joshua i think uh, uh, I, i think our panelists need no introduction such iconic brands being represented uh, you know across uh, domains from footwear to apparel men's women's fast fashion uh, we got a sports representation as well from mpl so uh, you know it's it's uh, an honor to have everyone here on a saturday evening uh, the last session before the award session is a tricky one we'll try and keep it short uh, within about 25 odd minutes um <clears throat> so you know I, i'll just move to the first question i think a couple of uh, panelists here uh, are actually iconic uh, offline brands one metro brands one uh, forever new um i think in this uh, uh, you know a uh, post pandemic or you know whatever we could call it uh, i think omni channel uh, earlier was more of a buzzword uh, where in india it was all more about omni fulfillment rather than the omni experience uh, i do know uh, that uh, both the brands are on omni channel paths so uh, just wanted some thoughts uh, one after the other uh, you know uh, maybe anju could go first uh and then you know alisha if you could share any of your general thoughts on uh omni channel post pandemic and and the reality uh, uh, you know rather than just the buzzword hi uh so yes forever new started its omni uh, business uh, way back in december december 2020 and i would say it wasn't an easy change uh, you know the mindset of people uh training the store staff to get into omni fulfillment the tech capabilities uh the team the bandwidth in the company it wasn't really there for us to start omni but uh, from the word go uh we delivered uh the team was charged up uh, we realized the benefits we could see the numbers trickling in in fact uh, uh in the month of december itself uh, we got 80% of our total business came from omni and even now it's still rocking 25 percent growth and 50% of the total business of our online channel comes from omni uh, so it has been a slow and steady uh, i would say it's a process uh, but now we are fully entrenched in and we are now onboarding other partners as well as going live for our own portal for omni also um, with inventory being such an expensive resource now it's being available across all channels to all the customers and i think the seamlessness of it is giving us results and we are very very happy about it sure excellent glad to hear that so alisha request you to please come in with any of your thoughts from an industry understanding you've got so much experience uh, with this thanks so much uh, so i think according to me uh, navin uh, omni channel is is definitely uh, online and offline as separate channels is only in the mind of the business it is not in the mind of the consumer for the consumer they want to reach out to a brand they want to do it with convenience it's where they can access so uh, for a brand to be omni channel is something that they need to do at the back end uh, it's not definitely for the consumer end having said that we've been running omni operations for our stores uh, i think since we started our website with tech or without tech and yes it is challenging but everything in e-commerce is challenging and what happens is that the devil is in the details you need to make sure that it's a compelling proposition for all stakeholders to partner in the journey and to make it a success uh there's there's no you can't uh the point is how do you enable it to make it you can so it needs to be convenient for the store managers it needs to be convenient for the people executing and it needs to be con- convenient for the um, for the customers e-commerce is frictionless and that's that's what you need to create excellent no no great thoughts to kick start uh, this and you know i'd love to now uh, uh, bring in uh, shobit as well as uh, sid uh, you know so sid's um, you know for i i'm not sure but i'd love to talk about it so so snitch has been uh, you know an absolute amazing crackerjack success story uh, started from scratch just uh, just pre pandemic or probably just in the midst of it and uh, significant scale as an online first men's fast fashion brand so said you know I, i just want you to you know just talk to us about i think the topic really is scaling one's d to c and the challenges and you've probably done that in the most challenging period so i'm, I'm sure we'd all love to hear a bit about your experiences there 
Sure. Uh, so um, with us, it was very different, right? Uh, we were uh, never focused D2C. Uh, it all happened all of a sudden. And uh, we just started our website with barely 30 products on the website. Uh, but gradually, we understood our consumers uh, really well. Uh, we understood that uh, this this could scale um, uh, to, a, to a huge extent. Uh, and that is uh, that is when we started, uh, you know, adding a lot of uh, categories, uh, playing with a lot of designs, styles, fits, fabrics, etc. Uh, more than that, I would say uh, it was the response that we got uh, from consumers. Uh, so uh, even the uh, repeats uh, that we have, uh, you know, it is it is at about uh, 35 to 39 percent, which is uh, phenomenal for a, a one year old brand. Which uh, shows, I mean, uh, for a fresh brand like ours, uh, trust becomes a, a huge factor uh, because of the kind of frauds happening on Facebook, Instagram, etc. Uh, to to gain that trust, uh, we we had to uh, work around a, a three sixty degree approach, uh, which I think the team is uh, phenomenally, uh, you know, done done that uh, really well, and uh, that is why uh, probably we've been able to uh, scale it uh, so fast. Excellent, excellent. So, so Shobhit, you know, so Shobhit runs the uh, MPL sports business. So having said that, you know, it's an extremely exciting time with a lot of sports now in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the IPL as well as the World Cup up there. And uh, I'm sure you're seeing huge growth in the sports uh, domain for MPL uh, here. Uh, and, and, and what's the kind of preparation that you're seeing and, and preparing for that scale, uh, uh, Shobhit? You know, and, and I know that the team's working... Uh, on tr- on on the uh, cus- consumer experience, the customer engagement side, uh, you know, what are the typical challenges life in a day's work that you're seeing uh, coming through the ranks? Yeah. Uh, so you know, it has been a fairly interesting journey last uh, seven months when we launched uh, our own brand, right? As in, uh, the idea of MPL Sports is actually to establish sports merchandising in India. Uh, I don't think uh, you know there has been a concentrated effort. Uh, in US, it's a pretty big industry, and in India, it's fairly underpenetrated, right? So we are basically solving from first principles, right? Uh, what should be the right product? What should be the right uh, distribution channel, pricing strategy, everything, right? So uh, last seven months were pretty interesting, and I think obviously there were a lot of challenges because you know MPL, uh, it's not in their core DNA, right? So to set up that team, and you know we took certain calls like you know. Uh, Let's not reinvent the wheel. There are a lot of standardized tech solutions, uh, you know, standardized logistics, CS services, and we should focus on where we are good at, which is, you know, kind of product and marketing, right? And uh, happy to say that I think the amount of effort that team has spent in last seven months, uh, you know, by, when you are dealing with Indian cricket team, you know, that's, I would say, proudly, you know, the biggest IP, which is there. Uh, we have kind of, you know, serviced uh, our customers really well. And, in terms of preparation, I think uh, while every brand talks about festive, I think this is our biggest festival. World Cup is coming. So we are all gearing up for that. And obviously, there are a lot of interesting plans uh, and very exciting journey for us in the next one and a half months. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. So, say the follow up question, I'll just probably go the reverse here. In terms of uh, technology or in terms of digital uh, for the consumer engagement side, uh, you know, in any specific items that the team's been focusing on to plan for scale. Uh, I know we are part of some of these discussions internally, but would love to hear a little more on your end. I mean, um, like I told you, it, it needs to be a 360 degree approach. Uh, so there's performance marketing. Uh, uh, there is a, a good amount of branding that is involved, uh, the product and consumers. Uh, so uh, we've, I mean, we've been doing uh, uh, things out of the box, uh, you know, uh, with our creatives, uh, with, with the kind of uh, the shoot uh, that we do, uh, basically, um, it, it is it is a little uh, not not so uh, e-commerce kind. Uh, the kind of engagement that we are doing with influencers is helping us a lot. Uh, so we we just don't want a dependability on one source. Uh, hence, it is a distributed uh, way of uh, marketing. Uh, going more organic. I mean, we just launched our app uh, like a couple of months back, and we have one lakh plus downloads, uh, which is you know, uh, a good start. I, I I don't think so. Uh, uh, any any brand would have seen such a, a positive response, but we we've, we've been able uh, or blessed to see that. So yeah, it, I mean, it is a combination of a lot of things. 
excellent so so alisha uh, back to you so uh, you know what i just wanted to pick your brain on is you know the consumer behavior we've seen you know uh, has changed there's a lot more adoption for tech uh, or the digital channel uh, you know for online purchase for lack of an option you know in most cases in the last couple of years but you know with physical retail you know coming back up hopefully uh, soon and sooner and quicker do you feel that the consumer buying pattern has really shifted uh, you know any any change that you feel about because i know you 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 very uh, into, uh, marketing as well and data and analytics what's your thought on have you do you really feel that the, there is a consumer shift that has actually seeded in in the pattern so uh, the way i respond to that navin is that the there has been a tremendous amount of digital adoption my mom didn't know how to shop online <laughs> until the pandemic so you you've definitely gotten that digital adoption happening pan india and that's something that is not going to go backwards you can't reverse that the fact is that consumers are far more comfortable shopping online what i uh, so consumer behavior has changed in that way but what i don't see is offline dropping because even now when we look at our sales that are re- uh, recovering in the offline space the 2019 numbers are also getting exceeded so the point is that offline shopping is not going to end online shopping will increase the why you go to a physical store is what offline retail needs to be a little bit more cognizant of and why are customers coming online is what now brands need to really understand and tweak their customer journeys accordingly so according to me india is a social country shopping for them is a social outing like mm. you want to go either with your family or your friends you want that excitement of retail therapy and it's it, it that emotion is not something that will, will really leave so you have to see it from both angles and you have to be very cognizant look at the data map customer journeys which i think we ourselves have a long way to go on to see sure. what is really happening but as a short answer that's it <laughs> sure sure no thanks a ton it, it does help lend perspective uh, i'll bring you in anshu because i know you're also uh, very much uh, you know student as well as you know leading the marketing efforts there uh how's it been in terms of the change in you know marketing strategies to push uh you know i i, I do know you know there's a huge organic uh, following as well for the brand given its origin with forever new but uh, apart from that on the paid marketing and on the technology uh you know what have been the efforts and initiatives in the last few months uh, anshu many i would say and uh, in fact it is at both ends for the online customer and for the offline customer and i resonate with what alisha said that the offline business is soaring high uh, without a real dip in the online business so the consumer behavior for our uh, particularly our brand like for revenue the offline business still holds the roost uh, however having said that there is a lot of con- consumer engagement lot of strategy changes to get the consumer has been underway uh yes we have a bunch of loyal customers and 70% of our business comes from them so a lot of paid marketing is now directed at getting them back getting them converted online uh having different kind of engagement strategies for them even at the offline in fact there's a hybrid model so in some stores the engagement would be at a very different level and in some cities the engagement is at a very different level so there are various and very hybrid kind of strategies that we are doing for different kind of customers and that's the change that has come uh, in our business that we've not we have stopped seeing customer as a singular entity and uh, so different strategies for different kind of people uh, different kind of customers is what's happening so remarketing the uh, uh efforts towards the getting the new uh, getting the repeat customers in uh getting you know the search words right to get the new customer in so a lot of thing different things are happening at our platform in fact we recently changed our agency also um, uh, you know and got into more efficient way of marketing and spending money the budgets have been increased because seeing the sales now the budgets are now uh, better to be invested in so yes a lot of action happening at that front excellent so so shobhit allow me to bring you in uh, you know i wanted to discuss uh, about i think one of the big 
reasons for this uh, D2C push is, you know, data personalization really insights into the customer journey. Uh, what have been, you know, internal initiatives on this front, uh, Shobitha? What's your view on that business when you compare it with the marketplace business? And there's a lot more available uh, on, in one's own D2C. Yeah, yeah, correct. As in, you know, I, I feel that, you know, D2C is, uh, you know, because we are an online-led brand, it's my store in online, right? As in, I can control the narrative. I can decide that how do I want to navigate the customer, right? So, uh, and being a sports-led uh, a property, which is, you know, built uh, uh, with Indian cricket team as the first IP, right? Uh, we use a lot of data to understand that who are the favorite players, right? Uh, for, for the customer, what do they like? Uh, even to give you an idea, right? Uh, for example, it's a very context-led selling that we do. So if India team does well in a certain format, we actually change the way the page looks, right? Or let's say if a player does well, right? So we have a lot of context around social, uh, you know, our uh, website, uh, the way we talk to customers, right? So we use data basis context and basis what the preferences of customers are, right? So that has really helped us push. Secondly, on D2C side, you know, it's a very strong sports led narrative that content, whether it's the journey such as, you know, uh, customization where people can put their names and number or, uh, you know, if uh, I, we have actually, uh, you know, uh, launched a lot of capsule collections, right, which is not possible on uh, marketplaces and you can actually enhance the brand, right. So these kind of initiatives we have taken and we are planning a lot more like this in the next one and a half months, right, which is typically not possible in marketplaces. Got it. Got it. Th thanks for shedding some light on that. You know, uh, when I was taking some, uh, you know, possible questions from the team in terms of what their takeaways would want it to be, from challenges of D2C, we couldn't uh, avoid uh, RTO and uh, COD. So I'd like to bring in, uh, you know, uh, Sid for one of them and Alicia for one of them. I'll give uh, the RTO pains to Sid so that Alicia has the time to talk about the COD pains. Uh, so anyone go first, please. Uh, Sid, do you want to... Uh, um, so you've seen us, right? Uh, like uh, we were an, at an RTO rate of what, about 45% when we started. Um, so again, uh, and I didn't even know the meaning of an RTO when we started. Actually. So, um, but then we uh, controlled, uh, we saw uh, where we could control, uh, added a lot of plugins, uh, did a lot of research, uh, added a bit of tools uh, and it, it has helped us. Uh, so what I typically feel uh, an RTO is... Uh, you know, it's like a termite, uh, which cannot be uh, removed uh, off uh, e-commerce, uh, D2C. Um, you'll have to live with it, but you could control it. And uh, we've controlled it now and got it below 20%, uh, which again, I think uh, is a great thing. Uh, and <laughs> it, it, I mean, you'll, you'll have to live with this. Uh, this is never going to go off. Uh, uh, yeah, RTO or COD. Some hacks of how, how you've reduced it. Uh, so, so like uh, we, we have these HRFs, uh, which are more towards uh, high risk of fraud uh, that is detected. Any temporary address, phone numbers, PIN codes, uh, we would uh, either call the customer or uh, cancel the, those orders. Uh, we've done a lot of follow up uh, things, integrated a lot of uh, solutions towards it. Uh, let it be the NDR uh, or fake remarks by the courier partners, which has helped us again bring it down by about uh, three or four percent. Uh, a lot of backend work is increased. Uh, we tend to call almost 500 to 600 orders on a daily basis uh, to verify uh, whether they, if they have any history of an RTO. Uh, so, yeah, again, like a combination of a lot of things, uh, which has helped us uh, reduce it to about 20, 18 or 20 percent today. Sure, sure, sure. So, no, no, I, I've been very close witness to some super efforts to bring it down by a, a, a big number there. So, you know, real kudos to the team there. Uh, and, and and so Sid, that that shirt out there is really nice on the back uh, hanger. Is that a bestseller there? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's an upcoming collection actually. Okay, excellent, excellent. So Alicia, we really need some help with how you know the, the COD space. How much do you think it can prepaid could be incentivized? How do you think it's better managed? What has been the experience uh, that you could share with us? 
Unfortunately, I really have no good news here. The biggest pain point of COD is just that it is extremely expensive, more than anything else. Um, on, not only in terms of the return percentage of COD transactions, but also the cost of doing COD. Right. Uh, so the fact is that honestly, at the beginning of the pandemic, we disabled COD and we really hoped, honestly, that that would be a COVID lining as such that, you know, customers would get used to prepaid. But unfortunately, uh, needs must, we had to switch it back on. It had to come back. And right. it still uh, is driving volume. The customer just feels too comfortable with that mode. Uh, another massive pain point is actually refunds. So the fact is that when you actually have to refund the customer, you've got to get their bank details, then go through all that manual process of speaking to them, that kind of customer service team, dedication, things like that, to ensure that that happens. So um, it's unfortunately a reality of the situation. And just on a broader base question, since we're on the topic of returns, I really think our logistics partners have a ways to go. I mean, we've received a pram. We've received a wow. three-piece suit. <laughs> we've received the most random kind of returns in our warehouse. So I, there's just a long way to go in the logistics part of e-commerce. Uh, is 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 my actual view on the subject. Right. POD sure. is just basically an expensive but very customer friendly option. Sure, sure. Can I say I, something, Alicia? Here, please, just take please. it as a cost of the business. <laughs> we've gone through this. We've been pained. You know, spent lots of uh, money on rectifying it. Doesn't happen. Sixty percent of our business still still comes from COD. Ninety eight percent of our NDRs are CODs. But that's the way, that's the cost of doing business is what I believe. One day, I think collectively, if we can figure out a solution to it, it's, I'll be the first one to, to grab it. We need to convince the marketplaces to switch it off, I think. <laughs> and then we can. Yeah, In fact, I'll give you an example. Tata, Tata Click for us, uh, so they disabled COD uh, for our brand because they realized that a lot of returns are coming from COD. And apparently, the business really didn't dip. But uh, I, it's a very slow, small business with them, so I'll not be able to comment. But they were the ones who did it with it uh, with our brand and did not really see a dip in the business. But we are not. Uh, we don't want to take that risk with bigger brand, uh, with bigger portals. Right, right, right. So, but you were saying something. Sorry. No, no, I was saying that this is a very interesting conversation. We just went live with COD last week, so I think I'm. We were we were always a you know believer in prepaid. And now this, I don't know whether it's encouraging or discouraging, but time will tell. <laughs> All the best. <laughs> yeah, no, the last time uh, I was doing a webinar a couple of weeks back, we had a, I won't name them, but we had a uh, logistics uh, player co-founder on the uh, panel. And, uh, you know, I, it seemed that the rest of the panelists were beginning to just attack, you know, the, the logistics part of it. And he started, uh, he came back with the self-defense saying, you guys are not marketing right. You know, so it came back to uh, us to just kind of even it up saying, you know, you need to target better, you need to get a better quality customer. Uh, you know, it, it's not the logistics and it kind of balanced the previous uh, panel discussion. So I ensured we didn't have one representation from that on this call. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I think, uh, you know, all, all, all fair thoughts. I think, you know, maybe just three or four minutes, you know, we'll probably spare one last thought uh, you know i know we've uh, already uh, overrun on time but uh, you know I, I, the, the the question that i had and probably you know shobit if you could help i think the marketplaces really have set a benchmark when it comes to the post order experience apart from taking care of um, uh, things like uh, cod and more encouragement etc which you've spoken about but the entire post order management is where they've done a stellar job and i think the d2c businesses because they're using third parties rather than their own logistics and their own payment gateways uh, are obviously struggling to match that level uh, you know and i do believe that that's the holy grail uh, if we are able to give that experience then customers will keep coming back because you know the amazon promise the mintra promise is very strong on that side any thoughts from you on that uh, shobhan no, you are right. As in, uh, we went live on Amazon and Flipkart like uh, a month back, right? And 
uh, there is no way i think uh, at least in my understanding all the d2c brands are fairly aware that there is no way you can match amazon and flipkart when it comes to the kind of customer friendly policies that they will have and the kind of infrastructure that they have created so we have taken a conscious call that you know uh, we will cater to a very different customer segment when it comes to our own d2c channel so we have a very loyal base right whenever we launch a new product they eventually come buy it because it happens first on our portal right uh or secondly they are you know quite used to our uh, website they know what kind of services they will get right so it's a very different tg so i think uh, at least you have taken a conscious call that we will have certain uh, metrics that we will manage and uh, uh, we will depend on third party services because uh, uh, you know having that uh, you know like whole warehousing logistics customer service in house is a cause that we don't want to internalize right now at a certain scale maybe we'll take those calls but uh, I, and i feel it's it's doing quite well right if you have uh, i think certain uh, if i leave certain variances i think it does uh, quite well but as as i said right i'm just getting into cod uh, let's see how how things change uh, but uh, if you set up a team which is like you know constantly working with the right vendors and having you know those a uh, corporation control it's it's a grant but it's still it's manageable and i think e-commerce is all about grant right it's uh, the you know the marketing is a sexy part but you know it's all about operations and logistics at the end of the day yeah i'm in i'm in yeah so just another perspective on this nareen uh, it's just see marketplaces are always going to be big box i think what's important for d2c brands right is to find the unique space in the product that they're offering to provide that differentiated experience so just if it goes to like for example selling footwear how can you make it easier for a customer to find this right. uh, again as i will say that this journey will always be ever evolving but my point is that that those are the levers of differentiation what that d2c brands have over marketplaces so right. there's no point fighting them on their strengths it's more like find the white spaces that you can win in yeah I think it's a great uh, thought, uh, you know, and and I'm just I just like to just go about and have our panelists help me uh, summarize or wrap up uh, for lack of uh, more time. But challenges to solve for while scaling up the D2C business. Any last thoughts from Anshu and Sid? Uh, one each from your perspective that we can leave for uh, our viewers, and then you know we can then uh, round it off. So. Uh... the last thought that i have is differentiate your portal uh, against the marketplaces uh, we do it with our product we offer new launches to our uh, customers way in advance uh, just a lot before then uh, marketplace offers uh, so yes uh, use the levers of differentiation for d2c portals and you'll rock excellent say your last word please yeah pretty much the same um, i would just add on that uh you could take heads on with the marketplaces at least with the post purchase uh, journey uh, we've done a lot of uh, things uh, towards this which is uh, helped us actually uh, retain our customers in terms of exchange or returns uh, <clears throat> as soon as a product is picked uh, from a customer the refund or exchange is initiated uh, which a lot of people want yeah. uh, we've seen consumers uh, telling the logistic partner that i'm giving you the product give me the money right now so <laughs> this is the perception that people have like uh, when they received it they have paid you so once you are taking it back pay me back uh, so we got a lot of uh, complaints uh, towards this and we worked with our logistics partners uh, got this integrated and uh, it is it is helped out so it is just about um, finding solutions uh, to your problems uh, should ease a lot of things excellent thanks a ton uh, it's been an absolute pleasure it's, uh, you know the half an hour was a breeze but with panelists like you i think we did touch upon a lot of challenges uh, and hopefully you know we'll send recorded versions back to whoever we can uh, so we can add value to anyone who's really looking to scale the d2c and uh, all the best to everyone there